We've gotten to the finalization process and today we will go through the steps of finalizing our approved provisional denture. What's gone on since the last time we were together is we have adjusted the hydrocast, we've adjusted the borders, we've added to the hydrocast, we've subtracted from the hydrocast, and we've checked the occlusion, the vertical dimension of speech, and the vertical dimension of occlusion, and our goal would be for us to have this denture approved by Mr. Bothy. And some of the things you want to make sure is that they speak properly, they're able to eat what they like to eat, and that they're comfortable and the dentures aren't flopping around in their mouth. What you're going to notice from this technique is the hydrocast is a wonderful material because you can add to it, you can take away from it, and patients get very, very comfortable. And when you refresh the hydrocast and you add to it, it actually gets a little bit of an adhesive quality for about 24 hours. I call that the training wheel effect. It gives them some little training wheels for a day or two that they can get used to maybe the bite change that you made. Now, some of the changes that you can make during the process of adjusting the hydrocast and getting to the finalization process, we have to move teeth sometimes. We may have the teeth too far out, or they may not be far enough out. The lowers may be too long. If you're using porcelain teeth, you can actually heat them up, pop them out of the plastic, reset them in some wax, try them in the patient's mouth, see how that functions, and then just cold cure those porcelain teeth back in. I showed you this prior to today with the lecture and some still shots. So our goals today are going to be able to take this denture that Mr. Bothy has approved, he's comfortable with, he can eat comfortably, and he speaks well with it, and capture that in a way that we can send it to the laboratory and they can make a final denture that simulates and is an exact duplicate of this approved provisional. Now the approved provisional denture does not have any posterior teeth on the lower. So they're going to add posterior teeth to the lower. This is also the time that we have to make some decisions. Do we want to use a permanent soft liner in the lower? and that sort of thing. Now, we've adjusted yesterday. Mr. Bothy came by the office early yesterday morning and we did a process called refresh. We refreshed the hydrocast. The way we do that is we scrub the approved provisional denture with Comet. I showed you this in some slides. And then we air dry it, bone dry. We paint just a little bit of chloroform over the surface of the hydrocast, which dissolves the surface. And then we added just a little thin, thin, thin wash of hydrocast over that refreshing hydrocast. What that does is it puts a thin skin of brand new hydrocast so that if there's any voids, bubbles, and actually hydrocast is acrylic. And so over time it shrinks a little bit. And so it really just snugs up the denture. The reason we do this 24 hours prior to the finalization is you cannot pour a stone cast into fresh hydrocast. In fact, you'll only do that once. Because what happens is the hydrocast has to mature for 24 hours or when you pour the stone into it, it will become one with the hydrocast, which is not a good thing. So the refreshing process is critical to a good accurate fit, in particularly if the laboratory that's going to process the final denture is using a very accurate process. We use the Avocap technique from Avoclar, and it's a very, very accurate process. And so, given that fact, we want to have the most accurate fit of the hydrocast prior to them receiving it. Mr. Bothy's denture, we're using uh, Crea Pearl anterior teeth, which are really, really, really pretty teeth. Willie Geller, who's a, a very famous laboratory technician from Germany, 
kind of came up with these teeth, and they're made out of composite. They're not porcelain. They're composite, which is the same tooth-colored filling material that we use. The nice thing about the composite is you can build different colors up in the teeth. You can put a dark color inside and then add a body color and then some incisal, which is exactly the same way we make crowns and, and, and real pretty veneers, which is really kind of a neat process. I think that the other thing you'd like about Creole Pearl teeth, if you try them, is if you have to trim them to fit into a space, you don't lose all your colors. You know, if you trim a porcelain tooth, a lot of times you lose all your glaze, you lose some of your body shades. But with Creole Pearl, you can trim it, you can thin it down, you can shorten it, and you can go up top and, and grind at the neck of the tooth and still not lose all your pretty colors. I'm almost exclusively using Creole Pearl anterior teeth now. Just because they're so pretty, why would you use anything else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they're a little bit more expensive than the average plastic tooth, but they're actually less expensive than porcelain teeth, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I, I pick a true bite shade um, or, and a true bite mold, just like we did before, and then I allow the lab to convert the true bite molds into the Creole Pearl molds because they know better which tooth will simulate what I've picked from another company. And I rely heavily on the laboratories to use their knowledge, skill, and judgment when it comes to materials a lot of times and, uh, and shapes. They're so much better at it than I am because that's all they do. That's all they do. So the first thing we're going to do when uh, we start to finalize is we want to do what we, we call a vertical recording. Now, when we take a bite record, to be able to finalize our denture, we're going to make an open mouth record, which means the teeth are going to be apart. We're going to be in centric relation, and so we're really going to be capturing a jaw relation. But if we can record the, the tooth to tooth position or the tooth to bite block position, which would be the vertical dimension of occlusion, somewhere on the denture, then when the lab technicians get this on the articulator, they know they're back to the original vertical when they get to that measurement. So let me show you how we're going to do that. We take two known st structures in the denture, and typically I go up to the interdental papilla between seven and eight. Bite together for me now on your back teeth. That's it. And the interdental papilla between 26 and 27. And I'll just make a mark. This is very arbitrary with a little alcohol marker. Now that's not going to wear off, but one of the things we want to make sure is, open for me now, please, sir. We we're not going to lose that mark. Thank you. Fits pretty good, doesn't it? Man. I'm going to take a number eight round burr and a little latch hand piece, and I'm going to make just a little indentation in the denture. And then if, can you pop me that lower one? Thank you. And I'm going to do the same thing on the lower. And I'm just going to make a little mark. Now, if my red mark comes off, Let's remark that in red, please, Kathy. Um, if my red mark comes off, I've still got the little indentation for the laboratory technicians. Now, they'll rebase this and completely remove the pink and put a new base on so we don't have to worry about leaving that gouge in the upper and lower denture. Now, I'm going to slip this back in. Take a look at that hydrocast. This was refreshed yesterday. And as you can see, it has recorded just beautifully. You could never make an impression like this man-made. If I tried to get this in alginate, you'd never get this. So the hydrocast is looking nice and clean. And if you notice, it's got that slick appearance. The other interesting thing I want you to take a look at is 
You remember we put our stops when we mix the pink acrylic with hydrocast liquid. In the old days, we'd grind that back and cover it with hydrocast. But since the pink was allowed to flow along with the hydrocast, we also made a mark down here, it just covered right up with the hydrocast, and I never had to grind it back out of there. This is a really, really neat way to do it, and it's just recently that we've started doing that. So let's slip this back in. Now, tap together a couple of times and hold tight for me now. Kathy's going to hold his uh, lips back for me, and I'm just going to use a true bite ruler. You can use a, a Bowley gauge if you'd like, and that would be fine. So center to center of the little marks is going to be 20 millimeters. 20 millimeters. Now, Kathy will record that so that when we send our... Uh, aesthetic and functional checklist with the case to the laboratory, there'll be a section on there for us recorded vertical dimension in the approved provisional denture. Then when the laboratory technician gets this and they're setting teeth, they can then verify when they get back to 20 each time that that tooth is down. It's just a little check and balance that'll make things go a little more smoothly. Once we've recorded our vertical we're going to take a quick face bow recording. We're going to use the Kois bow. The reason I like it is because it gives me a plumb bob, a vertical and a horizontal, and we're not using the Tragus Alloplane. We're using Frankfurt Horizontal Plane. So it looks like a Fox plane, but it's got a vertical component. We refer to it as the Kois bow because John Coyce is the person that came up with this. Kathy's going to mix some putty because instead of putting three little um, compound stops, we're going to put putty on this into these little indentations, and then that putty will allow us to record all of the upper teeth. Now what I'm going to look for is the midline of Mr. Bothy's denture, because we know it's in the midline of his face. We'll find the centrals. Now, Mr. Bothy, if you'll turn towards Elliot, what you'll notice is we've tried to line this vertical component up with the midline of Mr. Bothy's face. And the horizontal component, we're kind of using his earlobes as a guide, or his inner pupillary line as a guide. The nice thing about the putty is it sets pretty quickly we can pop it right out of there. The other thing we can do is we can take it off if we want to. Now, let me show you a mistake. I was going so fast and I was talking so fast, I actually got Mr. Bothy's anterior teeth in front of the little stop on the Koist boat, okay? You may think, well, that's okay. Let's just wing it from there. We'll just push it back. No. The whole point of this instrument is that within two or three millimeters, everyone's anterior teeth are 100 millimeters from the center of rotation of the mandibular condyle. So I'm not going to fudge it three or four millimeters. So what Kathy's going to do is she's going to mix me another one. I'll toss that one out. So we'll take this little face bow, we'll slide her in there. Now that's better. Drop your head down just a little bit. Perfect. And as you can see, it's almost the same. And the putty is soft enough so that you can kind of wiggle it around if you feel like you need to make a move. Now what if the midline of my denture teeth is not lining up with the midline of Mr. Bothy's face. Well, that's a good thing to know if you want to change it. If you don't want to change it, there is a place on the aesthetic and functional checklist that says 
leave the midline as is on the approved provisional denture. Or you could check the box that says, correct the midline to the new face bow. What a great communication tool that is for the lab technicians. Now we'll remove this and as you can see now, I got the labial surface of the incisors back behind the little stop there and this is much more accurate. It's also very clean. It didn't stick on the denture or anything like that. And so this is what we'll mount our upper box bead and pour denture with. Okay? We just put this to the side. Our next step is going to be taking a bite record. And what I'd like to do is I want to show you three different techniques. One of the things I've learned in teaching across the country is everybody prefers multiple ways to do things, but most people like one way. I'm going to show you my favorite way, but then I'm going to show you two other ways that are very popular throughout the country, and it may be that you don't like my favorite way, but I want to give you two other tools in your toolbox, so to speak. So we'll do a DLAR wafer bite record, just like we would if we were taking a centric bite record in a patient that has all their teeth. And the second one will be a central bearing point recording, a gothic arch tracing, which is very traditional, and many people prefer that technique over the Dillard record technique. And then thirdly, I'm going to show you the four squares technique. This isn't used very often, but on the West Coast, it must be that USC or UCLA teaches this technique, uh, but on the West Coast, a lot of people use this, and it's a very, very old technique when we used to use ZOE paste as a recording medium. So, yeah, ZOE paste. It's still one of the most accurate ways to do it, ZOE paste. Um, so, let me uh, show you how to do the Delar centric bite record first. The nice thing about a denture patient is you can take their teeth out and work on over on the lab bench. And when we're taking a centric bite record in a patient's mouth, it's kind of hard to verify that you've got it where you want it. So I'll take this piece of Dillar wax, and I'll make sure that I'm including the second molars all the way up to the canines. And just like you've learned in all the other courses, I'm going to trim this. Now, you see, if you could trim the wax in a patient's mouth, it'd be nice. But in the mouth, you've got to take it out trim it and put it back. So I'm just going to hold it on the denture, trim it right back to the buccal cusp tips. Then just like we've been taught before, I'll take my fingernail and just kind of press it up in between the teeth. You might notice that I used warm water to heat my wax. I prefer warm water over over a flame a lot of times because I can get the whole piece of wax warm and it will allow me to mold it a lot better. We'll make sure that you've got it up on to the second molar so it's not going to rock. If you look at this side, see how it's pulled away? I can just push that down while it's still warm. The other thing I can do is I can stick it back into my bowl of warm water and keep it a little warm. We've got it molded just like we'd like to see it in a patient's mouth. It's just that we can do it now outside of the mouth. I'm then going to chill this down in a bowl of ice water. The benefits of Delar wax is that when it gets cold, when it gets in ice water, it, it becomes very hard. Now I have a rigid bite recording material that I can pop back on and off once we've got the denture back in Mr. Bothy's mouth. And the key there is the rigidity in the palate. Okay? Now I'm going to let you just relax for just a second. Notice I let Mr. Bothy kind of position the denture 
get it back where it feels good. He's tapped on it a couple of times. And what holds a denture in is adhesion and cohesion. Adhesion is really a suction, if you will. Cohesion is the cohesive properties of water. And so if you took two pieces of glass and stuck them together with a drop of water between them, you couldn't pull them apart. You could slide them apart, but you couldn't pull them apart. And what I want you to notice with your denture patients is when you put the denture back in their mouth, the first thing they do, swallow. What that does is puts a little thin film of saliva between the denture and their soft tissues. This is another reason why this process of refreshing the hydrocast is so critical is because you want as intimate a contact as you can possibly get with the soft tissues so that it fits together like two pieces of glass. The adhesive property actually then comes from a little bit of suction that's caused by the soft tissues being compressed slightly. So this technique, the approved provisional technique, really plays on those two things and maximizes adhesion and cohesion, which is why most patients will not need any sort of adhesive device under their denture or any kind of sticky stuff or goo. I don't think you've worn any of that. No. No. Nah. Great. So we'll try the little record that we made over on the bench, and obviously it's going to fit. In fact, you don't actually have to hold it. If for some reason you don't have a dental assistant available to you, they're in another room or you just don't have anybody to help you, if you'll put just a little tiny bit of Vaseline on the biting surface of the wax, it will dissolve the wax just a tiny bit and it'll stick it up there for you so you don't have to have somebody in here to help you. But we have Kathy to help us today. And so if I turn, get Mr. Bothy to turn, I can verify that that wax is down because I can see the buccal cusp and the cusp tips all the way down in the wax. If we had a big piece of wax that kind of flopped out over the side, you wouldn't be able to verify that it's down. Turn this way for me now, Mr. Bothy. Same thing on this side. We can verify that that cusp tip is all the way down into the wax. This has been talked about for many years by Dr. Dawson and everybody that teaches at the Dawson Academy. And this is a critical factor in knowing that your accuracy is there. Okay, now we know we have a bite record that fits. It's rigid because we cooled it down. Now what I'm going to do is just flame this section. And before we do that, I'm going to take Mr. Bothy's lower. And you see our bite blocks? He's just done real well against those bite blocks. There's not a real good indexing mechanism back there other than the block. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an acrylic burr and I'm going to make some notches on the edges of the bite blocks so that when I record with my Dillar wax or whether I'm using putty or whether I'm using whatever, central bearing point, then we'll have notches that will help us get it onto the articulator. So I'm going to run back in the lab for a second and I'm going to put those notches in, and I'll be right back. What I'm going to do now is using our bite record, I'm going to warm the underneath surface that the bite block and the lower teeth are going to come into. I've made some notches in my bite block on the approved provisional denture. And if you've taken all the courses, all the Dawson courses, you know exactly what I'm doing. I'm just doing it exactly like a patient that would have natural dentition. The great thing about Dillar Wax now is it's going to hold a lot of heat for us and give us plenty of time to work. I'm going to jump over to Mr. Bothy's mouth. Kathy's going to help me by holding the upper bite record in and lifting up on the denture just slightly. My hand position is going to be just like we would be using for a patient with teeth, except I'm going to put my thumbs on the area of the canines. I can load his joints. I'm going to get you just to relax your jaw now. I'm going to lift up. We'll load that joint, and let's come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. Kathy's going to hold it on the upper, and I'm going to open him a little bit. Now 
let's close for me now. Give me a little squeeze. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. I'm lifting up on his jaw and I'm pulling that condyle up into its uppermost, midmost position. We're going to let that wax set for just a minute. And I'm going to turn Mr. Bothy's head way to his left. And so you can see now, we've engaged the wax all the way up to the canine. So we've got, instead of tooth, wax, tooth, we have tooth, wax, bite block in the posterior. And we have tooth, wax, tooth in the anterior. And that would be denture tooth, wax, denture tooth. Now you can see our little vertical marks are evident because we highlighted them with red. This being an open mouth record, I can now measure that again. And we're at 23. So we've actually got a three millimeter opening. And that's one of the reasons that we like to record this. So the laboratory, once they get it on the articulator, they know they bring it back to 20. Then they can set the pin and they can determine that vertical that way. Okay, let's open for me now. What's interesting is I can take the whole assembly out with a denture patient, which will really help you visualize this. You can see here's my little notches here and here and here. I have some on the inside. There's my marks, my vertical recording marks. I can take this whole assembly and put it in the cold water to chill it down. We've been standing here long enough that I think it's probably chilled enough that I can just pop it off. And so I've got good recordings here. Let me show if you can see this, Elliot. My little notches I put in the sides of the bite block. I didn't put it on the top. And the reason I didn't was I wanted to preserve the occlusal contacts on the bite block. So I just put them on the sides. And our wax, we ought to be able to go back and put it right back to place. And it's, in my book, nice and stable. Now let me show you a little trick when it comes to, to doing this. She's going to put a little lubricant on the bite block. And in the area of the canine bicuspid, canine bicuspid, and in the area of the back part of the bite block, I'm going to take a little excess piece that we trimmed off when we were trimming our bite record. And I'm just going to drop it in four little dots. Now we know that this wax that I've dropped in here is dead soft. You can see the shiny nature of it. So what I'm going to do is just lightly put it through my warm water to temper it and see the shininess went away. It's still very soft. I'm going to take it over to Mr. Bothy's mouth. And we're going to do the exact same process. And I'll get my hand position and we'll very gently close up for me. Open just a little bit. Close up. Come on up, come on up, come on up. Tiny little squeeze. Hold. Okay. I'm going to use a little bit of air. Excuse me. I'm going to cool those down just a little bit. Now open for me. Part of the reason we put the Vaseline on the lower teeth to get it to let go. Now you can see I've got one, two, three, four dots. The stability of that when we get to the lab is excellent. Now when I put that together, you'll notice there's a little gap between the dots that the bite block's not touching the wax. So we only have four places touching. This is what I call the four dots technique. 
I do this in patients that have natural teeth too. In particular, they have a mobile second molar because the canines are most often the most firm teeth in a patient's mouth and the second molars are the most often loose tooth in a patient's mouth. So using this dead soft wax technique I find works great. If you have some concern about the rigidity of your bite record, Kathy's mixing a little bit of lab putty. I'm going to take a pinch of lab putty and put between the dots. We can go back to Mr. Bothy's mouth. You notice our bite record is nice and rigid, almost snaps in over the teeth. Now let's gently close, 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 close. We're going to find the dots. Now we found the dots and we have got putty between the dots that will offer us a rock solid bite record when we get into the laboratory and we want to mount this case on an articulator. There again, this is an open mouth record but we've recorded his original vertical with our little red marks. Now open for me please sir. This becomes a very rigid, very solid record. Now you can see my notches have come up in putty. We can trim this putty down, we can trim the wax down. I can slide this right back in. And let's slip this out for a second just to demonstrate to them. And you can see now how solid that would be. If we had stone cast poured into these little dentures, then that would be really solid on our articulator. Also take note, this is also a good thing to look for. Notice the heels of our denture are not striking. If the heel of this denture the area over the maxillary tuberosity or the area over the retromolar pad was striking when we closed him down, that would dislodge his dentures every time he closed. It would be no different than if you had a second molar that was in the way on the arc of closure. And it would be constantly dislodging Mr. Bothy's denture. An open mouth record ensures that that won't happen. But if you recall, we marked it with a clusal indicator wax to make sure too. So there's two of our techniques, the conventional Delar wax and the four dot technique. And then the next technique I'd like to show you is the central bearing point technique. Before I show you the central bearing point technique, I want to show you what we do with our Delar wax. I did it instinctively a minute ago. We always float our wax in water. Do not let the Delar wax sit on the counter. Wax is actually fluid. And if you sit it on the counter, it will flatten out. And so we keep our uh, bite records, whether it's for a patient with no teeth or a patient with teeth, floating in water in a little cup with their name on it. You can write the patient's name right on the middle of the Delar wax with one of those Sharpie markers. Drop it in there. And when you get ready to use it back in the lab, you can just go fish it out of the container in the refrigerator. Now, the next technique we're going to do is a central bearing point. And I use these little brass door hinge devices that Bill Cave up in, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, he makes them and he sent me some of them and I find that these are easier to use than the other central bearing point devices. There's many different kinds of central bearing point devices and in fact there must be 15 or 20 different kinds. Even in the old combi kit from the early 80s there was a set of clutches that had a central bearing point. Our goal is to deprogram the mandible with a central point that allows the condyles to seek their uppermost position bone braced without really having to put your hands on a patient's mouth. The other nice thing about the central bearing point is that it actually holds the lower denture and the upper denture in place as you're doing it. What Kathy and I have learned over the last few years is that a hot glue gun works great. It cleans off the denture nicely and if you want to move the central bearing point all you've really got to do is heat up the central bearing point, the hot glue loosens up 
and you can slide it around. You'll see why we might want to do that in a few minutes. I've already placed the upper member and you can see we've got this little adjustable screw that we can go up and down with. The way I did that was I eyeballed about what would be the center of the upper and the lower just by holding it in my hand. And then the little skid plate should go just behind the bicuspids. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit of hot wax, I mean hot glue, and I'm just going to put a little bead. Mr. Bothy, we're going to uh, cool this hot glue down before we put it in your mouth. Thank you so much. Yeah, I figured you'd appreciate that. If you've ever had hot glue on your tongue, you know that it's bad. Oh, God, the cheese on a pizza would do the same thing. I want to try and keep this fairly level if I can. The nice thing about the hot glue is you can kind of shift it around a little bit before it sets completely. So this would be the skid plate that that point is going to run against. Glue cool? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> I touched it with my tongue to make sure. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I think the hardest part about this is the patient's tongue is going to want to lift up on that lower. But they get used to it pretty quick. And let's just gently close from here. And as you can see, he's on the skid plate, but he's open pretty wide. What I'm going to do is I'm going to screw that upper member down a little bit so he's not so wide open. Isn't that close? Slide your jaw forward and back for me now. There you go. Now side to side. And it's that movement, that side to side, forward and back. Drop back all the way for me now. Close. Forward, back, forward, back. Now, a lot of people would just let a patient sit with this in for a few minutes. Go do something else. Go check the hygiene patient or something, and then you come back, and what you've done is you've deprogrammed. I'm going to drop the, the little central point down just a little bit more. Now close. Forward, back, forward, back. Now we can take this lower out. And on this little brass plate, you will start to see the lines of a Gothic arch tracing start to form. An easy way to do this is take one of these Sharpie markers and just coat this area. We'll put it back into Mr. Bothy's mouth. Now close. Tap a couple times for me. Okay. Forward and back. 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 Now move your jaw to that side. Excellent. Now come to this side. That's known as third base and first base. Okay. Forward and back. Second and home. Second and home. You're exactly right. I love it. What we're looking for at our central bearing point is here we are side to side. Here he is forward and back. We didn't get much of a, uh, a right side. But if you look very closely, we're starting to form a point right there. That point, the apex of the Gothic arch tracing, is the point at which the condyles are as far up and bone braced against the medial pole. Tap, tap. Forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. Now all the way back one time. And hold it right there. Can you tap right there? Okay. Now let's go uh, third and first, but very short movements. I'll get you to come to this side one time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Now, forward and back. Now, hold it all the way back. Yeah, he's right on it right now. And that right there would be a jaw relation that would be considered centric relation. And that's the, the point that we want to record. Oh, man. The classic Gothic arch tracing. And that point at the very tip is centric relation. Now, it's going to be hard to take a record now and Mr. Bothy kind of hold in that position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a round burr and I'm going to make just a little dimple in that brass so that that screw from up top will sit into that dimple and he doesn't have to worry about holding it there. Bite down for me. Slide back. There it is. He clicked right into the dimple that we made. Now what we want to do is somehow we have to be able to record that. What we're going to do is inject some bite recording material on both sides, even over the little brass central bearing point things. But I want to make sure I get back here where the second molar is. Doesn't matter what sort of bite recording material you use. Um, I'm not sure what this is, but a lot of people use blue moose. Yeah, just don't get it in your hair, huh? Um, Want to make sure I got that second molar really good, and then up here in the bicuspid area, and maybe even the canine. And then we'll just, uh, it's very easy for Mr. Bothy to hold into that position because we made that dimple. You can get them to stay where they are, but some patients, will, their, their muscles will start to vesiculate and kind of jump a little bit. I have a patient or two that has Parkinson's disease, and they have a very difficult time holding in one spot. The central bearing point is an excellent way to deprogram a Parkinson's patient. Now as we've been going through this whole process, we've, we've filled out our aesthetic and functional checklist, and Kathy has recorded that vertical. Okay, thank you. Now you can see we've recorded. We can pop right in. This is much more open than the other techniques. We can trim this down if we want to. We'll get these box beaded and poured, and then we'll try it back into the recording paste. If for some reason you want to add to this, it's real easy to do. You can do it in your hand. Just add to it out in your hand. You don't have to put it back in their mouth. We feel like we have everything. This is the approved provisional that we can now submit to the laboratory for finalization. But what the heck is Mr. Bothy going to do for a denture while we send this to the lab? Our hydrocasted duplicate dentures will now give Mr. Bothy something to wear during the time that we're making his final denture. Now the nice thing about that is the duplicate denture is a duplicate of the approved provisional. So it's going to look good. It's going to have hydrocast in it, so it's going to feel good. And it's not a huge difference from what he's been wearing. Your other alternative is to give them back their original denture. Tell them to just put their original denture back in their mouth. Now the problem with that is that their original denture now just won't fit. In fact, it'll fit. It'll fit like socks on a rooster. It's going to be wobbling around in there, and it's going to make their gums sore, and they're not going to be able to eat. And frankly, it's the reason you're making them a new denture to begin with. So. Our duplicates will also serve as their spare denture long term. So let's put his duplicates in, Kathy. Let me uh, put a fresh glove on this hand. Okay. And throw rocks at the old teeth. Yeah, we. <laughs> I like that. Throw rocks at the old teeth. Now let me ask you this, or tell you this: If you're having a hard time with the patient and they're questioning the fees for your denture, and they're not paying in a timely manner. 
Give them their old dentures back. <laughs> That's called closing the sale. Don't you like that? And actually, for those patients that have been ornery through the whole process, I might do that, really, just to make a point and say, I'm a lot better than you thought I was. Because <laughs> think about it. You put your old ones back in when we started back. Ooh, it's awful, isn't it? I'm sure it was. Yeah. But have their duplicate ready to go, because if you give them back their old denture, within 24 hours, they're going to call you and say, I can't wear these things. And well, you know, if you come by and pay your bill, we've got a duplicate for you that we can put in. The nice thing about our duplicates, too, is they have hydrocast in them. Mm -hmm. Any better? It might take a minute to warm up. <laughs> warm up. Hmm. And notice his lower spare has got bite blocks on it. He's going to be comfortable during the process of uh, finalization. One of the nice things about this, too, is we never have to rush the lab. I think sometimes our quality will go out the window become, because we're trying to get a rapid turnaround time. And one of my goals as what I would consider a, a high-level practitioner is to work with some of the best laboratories in the world. And for you to get a great result from them, you've got to give them time not just with your crowning bridge and your veneers, but with your prosthetics, whether it's a precision partial, uh, precision denture, the whole approved provisional technique. Why spike the ball at the five-yard line? Go ahead and give the lab time, particularly if you're going to do a soft liner or some custom uh, occlusals or something like that. So the labs always love it when I, when I teach this because I'm going to give you the tools to give them time. Now, We'll probably have Mr. Bothy's finals done in three or four weeks. Um, and uh, in the interim, if he has any soil places with his uh, duplicates, we'll adjust them. We can add to some hydrocast. Uh, it makes it a very simple process to keep a patient comfortable during that month-long period. Sometimes the lab will get them back a little quicker. And if they do, we'll go ahead and call the patient and say, hey, man, we got your teeth back. Uh, how about coming this afternoon we'll put them in? Because the insertion process is what we'll do next. Um, and we'll demonstrate to you how to put that final denture in, to grind it in, which is, I think, a very important component, and set that patient up for a follow-up.